You know, I was actually sitting there thinking, did I put those notes up there? And I thought, oh, surely I did. Uh, surely I did, and then when I came up here, so you needed to greet just a little bit longer, and then, <laughs> then it would have been seamless. Uh, would have been seamless. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. So we're turning the corner into the last section of uh, the last chapter of the epistle, first epistle of John, that, uh, as John mentioned, the, that last song that we just sang, very, very much in the form of a prayer that we would be able to hear the Lord speak to us, which is a tremendously appropriate prayer whenever you're going to get ready to read the Bible, but uh, extraordinarily appropriate prayer when we're in a worship service like this for an exposition of the Word of God that, that from the words on a page, God himself would speak to us. So that is our prayer for this morning as we, let's stand together and we'll read the first two verses of 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, it is our prayer this morning that you would be gracious to us. Oh God, for we live in a world where there are many who seek to trample down your truth. And it happens all day, every day, all around the world. There are people oppressing your people. There are enemies trampling them down, fighting against them from places of pride and influence, coercive power, the ability to threaten and to carry out threats in many, many places in the world against your people. And we pray in their behalf and in our behalf this day that we would not be fearful to live in such a place, but that we would trust you and that in you we would find the strength to praise your name and praise your word. That we would trust in you with all of our hearts and have the confidence to say, if you are with us and for us, what can men do to us? And yet regularly we find ourselves vexed troubled by circumstances, by trials, sometimes brought on by men, as we've been saying, but other times, just the circumstances of life, the death of loved ones, the loss of our health, trouble in our most fundamental relationships, uncertainty about the world around us, 
All these things trouble us. We find ourselves at times unable to sleep in the middle of the night, but as the psalmist says, you count all of our tossings on such nights. You catch every one of our tears in your bottle. They are written in your book, every tossing, every tear. In the end, what looks so ominous now will end with all of the enemies of your people being turned back wherever they are, no matter how ominous they may be, and that we can come to the assurance right now and rest in it and stand in it and take comfort in it that you are for us. As the psalmist says, this we know, that God is for us. That it's in you that we praise, even as we've been doing this morning. And it's in your word that we praise. Father, we ask that you would keep our feet from stumbling as we walk through life. And that you would enable us to walk through this life conscious of your presence and to walk in it by the light of your living ones. For we are gathered together this morning to study the light that is used by your spirit to bring your living ones to that life, to gather them in worship now, and eventually to gather them in worship forever in a new heaven and a new earth. We thank you for the opportunity of gathering this day, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. My name is Pastor Randy, and Pastor Don opens us very, very consistently each week by reminding us that we are about knowing God and making him known. But then uh, goes on to say that we are becoming disciples. As I mentioned, we're in the fifth chapter now of 1 John, which means we're going to swiftly be coming to the end of 1 John. We should, Lord willing, finish up 1 John the last Sunday in front of Christmas, and then we'll turn around in the new year, again, Lord willing, and take up the Gospel of Mark. New Testament scholar passed away just a few years ago at a relatively uh, young age. His name was Rodney Decker, and Rodney Decker wrote the uh, uh, Baylor Greek handbook on the Gospel of Mark. In his little introduction to that handbook, he summarizes what the Gospel of Mark is about in a little paragraph. And what's so interesting for us this morning is what that Gospel of Mark is supposed to be about is also exactly the same thing. That our two verses here in 1 John are about in a pretty clear fashion as you try to summarize them. Here's what uh, Rodney Decker wrote about Mark's Gospel. Mark's purpose is related to Discipleship, that's why it's a great book for us to study, right? We are becoming disciples. Mark's purpose is related to discipleship. 
He works it out paragraph by paragraph by challenging his readers to answer two intertwined questions. Who is Jesus and what does he expect from those who follow him? So who is Jesus? And what does Jesus expect from those who follow him? Mark's answers are not stated in a formal way as an argued thesis. Rather, they are demonstrated in a, in a narrative form. The included stories have been selected and arranged to prompt both questions in the reader's mind and to marshal the evidence that leads to the intended answer that Jesus is a powerful savior who is worth obeying. Right? We, just, we just sing a whole song about that a few minutes ago. Right? If you paid attention to the lyrics in that, in that song, what a beautiful name it is. That's what the whole song from beginning to end was about. That Jesus is an infinite, eternal, divine Savior whom it is essential to follow if we would spiritually survive. So who is Jesus? And what does he expect? the two central issues as well in 1 John 5 where John simply argues the born again as part of their new birth package inevitably come to know who Jesus is and the born again as part of their new birth package the born from above they also inevitably come to follow Jesus in a particular way, in a very word of God related way. Um, that concept of born from above is the concept. John has been using it all through 1 John but it's introduced in his gospel in, in chapter 3, right, in that famous interview between Jesus and Nicodemus that was read, uh, that John read this morning as part of the uh, uh, song set, worship set. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, the ESV has probably better, unless one is born from above. That same language is showing up in our text. Born from above. He cannot see the kingdom. That third verse is a little ominous in the interview, right? And Nicodemus takes it as such. Where Jesus says, by way of warning, unless a person is born from above, let me tell you about that person. They are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. To put it as a, a child might think of it, they are not going to go to heaven when they die. That's what he's saying. That's what it's about. They are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. For truly I say to you, unless you are born from above, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the obvious question Nicodemus asked was, what, what do you mean by born from above? And then Jesus goes on to, to answer that question. 
But John, here in 1 John 5, 1 and 2, is ready with the answer to the question that will inevitably come after that. Okay, so here's this description of what it means to be born from above. So the next obvious question is, what they have that? Whether they have experienced this birth from above? Well, that's the whole of 1 John. And in miniature, that's the whole purpose of 1 John 5, 1 and 2. The answer to that question. How can a person know that they have been born from above? state our thesis for this morning this way. Those who have been born again or born from above will evidence this in their beliefs, their love, and their relationship to commandments. That's what John argues in these first two verses. Those who have been born from above will evidence this in their beliefs, their love, and their relationship to commandments. So I have three related questions to their beliefs, the love, and the commandments. The love and commandments thing, are I put them into two points, but they're indistinguishable from each other in John's thinking and in his way of writing. Uh, but first of all, who do we or who do you believe Jesus to be? Who do you believe Jesus to be? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who genuinely, truly, at heart level, believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now, I, I think the grammar here is, is important. You don't want to press it too much, but the first... Everyone believing, every single person believing, there's a present participle, that Jesus, present verb, is the Christ. And then we go uh, to a, uh, a passive perfect, has been born at some time in the past with, with results continuing into the present. So everyone presently believing Jesus is the Christ, John is arguing, as at some time in the past had this experience back there with ongoing results into the present. They have been born from God. Uses his, his favorite little phrase here throughout 1 John, um, in relation uh, to that, that little ek tu theu, from God. From God, ek tu theu, he has been born. Everyone who believes presently that Jesus is the Christ, he has been born of God. The World Series is being played right now in um, you know, 53 years ago, I was a baseball player. I mean, there's a little league. Uh, I was a little league. Um, played in, in Wonder Lake. I, I played for the White Sox. Um, we played behind um, the Roman Catholic Church there. There was uh, a couple of diamonds behind the Roman Catholic Church. And at that time, I, just, I didn't think much about the name of that church because that particular Roman Catholic church was by far the largest church in, 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 in Wonder Lake. Um, but it was, it was infamous uh, because they happened in those years in the uh, late 1960s 
to have uh, a priest who was um, drunk a lot. And so it was broadly speaking kind of a, a scandal in the community, but what, what scandalized it to the breaking point to be sober for Sunday morning mass. Uh, that was the crisis point, and that, that eventually came to pass. And anyways, it was, a, it was widely discussed, you know, because we were by far dominated as a Roman Catholic community. So there in Wonder Lake, the, price, the, the priest at this church was the talk of the town in many ways when I was a kid. The church bore this really impressive title in John's mind, though. The church was known as Christ the King. Christ the King. That's, 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 a, that's a big, bold statement. Christ the King. Repeated line in uh, uh, How Beautiful is the Name was this. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. My King. Which is precisely what John is talking about here. Can you, are you able to say that? To speak of, I know that Jesus is the Christ. And I know him as my Messiah, the anointed one, the anointed one. Well, the anointed one from the Old Testament. See, I mean, Samuel went out and who did he anoint? He anointed David to be king. The anointed one is the king. The Christ is the king. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. John plays that card repeatedly throughout his gospel and repeatedly throughout this epistle. In the gospel chapter, is disputing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in verse 24 of chapter 8, he says this to them. I told you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now in some ways that's a perfectly good translation. However, when you're, when you're reading the, the Greek text, and Pastor Don was talking about this just last uh, Sunday night because we were in Exodus chapter 3 with the I am that I am statements between God and Moses there. Who shall I say will send me? Tell them, I am send them to, will send them to you. I am that I am. That sort of language. We went into what that looks like in Greek. Well, here's what it looks like in Greek. He uses that. There's no definite object to this thing. What Jesus was written in John is this. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am. It just sits there. No, I think they translated it right in this case, that I am he, that I am the Christ, that I am the Son of God. But he puts it very provocatively. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's a big picture of Jesus there. Whoa. Whoa. So, see, the evidence of having been born 
from above is that you recognize Jesus as the Christ. But as a, a really exalted form of the Christ in John's gospel, of course. Also in John's gospel, Jesus with the woman at the well, she comes to the end of his discussion with her just as the disciples are coming back. Very similar thing, First John 4, 25, 26. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah comes, who is the Christ, just Christ being the Greek for Messiah, Hebrew. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, And he does the same thing. He says, I am, comma, the one speaking to you. Now that very clearly, right? I am the Christ, but I am the one speaking to you. Because in John's gospel, see, we know. We know now what she would have never expected. We know that the Christ turns out to be the one who was in the beginning with God, who was God, that all things were made through him and apart from him was not anything made that was made. So context is king. By the time you get to chapter 4, with the gospel opening that way, when Jesus says, I am the one speaking to you, now, in, in immediate context, of course, it clearly means, I am the Christ. But in the context of John Gospel, four chapters in, given the way it began, it's at least quite a striking statement. All of that to say, and perfectly reflected in that song that we sang together this morning, do, do we have, have we come to an exalted view of Jesus as the Christ, as the King? Do you walk around through your life with a massive view of Jesus, his importance, his glory, his majesty, his power. He has the pivot to spiritual survival for anyone and everyone in the world. You walk around knowing Jesus is the Christ. He's Christ the King. The born again, that's how they view him. That's how they see him. That's what John writes. Everyone believing that Jesus is the Christ from God, he has been born. Secondly, so who do you, who do you believe Christ to be? Who do you love? Who do you love? And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born from him, says the ESV, and most all the modern translations. So everybody gives up the play on words here, except the King James Bible. The King James Bible hangs on to this play on words that John is using here. And so here's how the King James reads the second half of verse 1. And everyone that loveth him that begat loves him also that is begotten from him. So the little play on words is begat and begotten. And everyone, again, present participle, everyone loving the one who decisively Begat, the one who creates new birth in people, he loves also the one, and then back to a 
Another one of those passive participles. Those having been begotten. Sometime in the past with results continuing right on into the present. Us, your fellow believers, those who have been born from above. It started at some time in the past and your present beliefs and your present loves are the evidence that it happened to you. And there it is, presently existing right now. Um, the one who begat, Father, as the translation says, those having been begotten, believers. So see, that sort of language, that's the language that is being used by John all over this epistle. We looked at it and saw it really prominently, right? 1 John 4, 4 to 6. You are from God, little children. Verse 6 in that chapter. We are from God. We have been born of God from some time in the past and right up into the present. That's who we are. And wherever that, wherever that occurs, wherever that occurs, then there's going to be a certain kind of love. But see, we are to know that about ourselves. That's what's being the begat and those having been begotten, what that language is about is so that you and I know that our Christian faith is something that God did, much more fundamentally than something that we did. It's a divine accomplishment. It's not a human accomplishment. Now, we were really involved. We really made decisions, all of that. But no, more fundamentally, it is a divine accomplishment, not a human accomplishment. Accomplishment. Uh, Thirty some years ago, and went out to uh, to a church in Iowa, Center Grove Evangelical Free Church. It was out in the country. It was about a third of a mile up a gravel road, just north of Highway Three, which cuts its way across Iowa. And as I've said before. Uh, in halfway decent weather, it was regular practice. We had one child when we moved there, and so about a, by the time we were doing this, she was a year and a half old. And so after supper, uh, as a way to uh, uh, you know pass about a half hour pleasantly with everybody, you know having having a good time, I would take her for a walk down to the highway and back. So we would just walk along, and and. Um, and, in, and at a year and a half, she pretty much just talked nonstop about whatever. Uh, and so eventually, we'd, we'd play a theological game uh, every night a, a, as we did that. We'd get into, uh, she would ask me, she'd start to ask me the question, who made the grass? Well, of course, God did. And then who made the trees? And God did. And who made the clouds? And God did. And who made, and then, then you know, try to throw me the old curveball, you know. Who made the fence? <laughs> yeah. Well, we kept God in the equation, but then we, you know, complicated it up a little bit and talk, talked how that worked and how people made in the image of God do certain things. But, but that, that's what we did. We did that over and over and over and over again. I wouldn't even be able to guess how many times, and eventually two, you know, two kids were taking that walk and doing that with great regularity, and, um, and on it, and on it went. Well, see, John is trying to get us to think about our own experience in this same childlike way. Where did your faith come from? From God. Where does the perseverance of your faith come from? From God. Where does the clarity of your faith come from? That, from God. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. That's his view over and over again. From God. From God. God is the one who has begotten us. I happened to be reading in Psalm, in my Psalms reading, went through Psalm 80 this, this week. Last verse in Psalm 80, we sing a hymn based off of this uh, together, a praise song. 
O Lord God of hosts, restore us, cause your face to shine on us, and we shall be saved. It's a series of causative verbs there. Turn us, cause your face to shine on us. That's the prayer. Because when God turns us and when he causes his face to shine on us, the third thing is the inevitable outcome. We shall be saved. We shall be saved. God does it. He turns those who turn. He shines on those who see. And they shall be saved. And so here's where John goes with this. And everyone loving the one who begot, namely God, because it's by the same work of God, they inevitably love those having been born of God because it's absolutely the same spiritual principle from God that produces love for God and love for people. And so do you have that? Do you love God? Do you love the people of God? Those who have been born from above do, they will, they must. It's of the very nature of who they are to do that. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, born from God, and whoever loves the Father loves the one born from him. Third and finally, whose commandments do you obey? Whose commandments do you obey? I've already mentioned the World Series has been on television. The two guys that call the games for Fox, a guy by the name of Joe Buck and another one by the name of John Smoltz. Now Smoltz, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't, you know, for you non-baseball fans, uh, it's the Houston Astros and the uh, and Atlanta Braves are playing in the World Series. Well, Smoltz spent 90-some percent of his career uh, preach, uh, pitching for the Atlanta Braves. Um, and he, he's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, so he was, uh, he was a way, way, way above average pitcher. But hence, by having him in the booth, you spend a lot of time analyzing what pitchers are doing, because that's what he was. And of course, it's also the thing that's constantly happening in a, in a baseball game is pitches are being thrown. And so you're, you know, he spends a lot of time analyzing, um, and uh, and you know, and, and some pitchers are are known for having just an excellent curveball. It just looks like it's not, it's going to be well out of the strike zone, and then, boy, as it's crossing the plate, guess what? It's right back in the strike zone. And, it, and it's, it's moving down, and, it, and it, it's just really hard for the average guy to hit. And he'll comment on pitchers who have that, that when they put that into the mix, it can just wreak havoc. Um, and, and therefore, that, you know, he'll comment that pitcher, a, a batter has to really, really, really think about how to handle that curveball. Well, John, as a theological writer, in, in, in verse 2, he throws us a curveball here. Um, it's, he, he, he says something that it seems to be said backwards, but he's definitely saying it on purpose, and he's saying it to get us to think about what we've been talking about here in a helpful manner. So here's what he does. By this, that, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. Well, no, no, you say, well, he said, he's, he was saying that the other way around just a little while ago. How can you love God whom you have not seen if you don't love man whom you have seen? No, no, so the test is actually the other. But no, that's not what he does here. This is, this is the theological curve. Um, he says, here, in this we know 
that we love the children of God. How? Oh, when we love God. What? And keep his commandments. Now remember, for John, loving God and keeping commandments are very, very much unbreakably tied together. Um, 1 John 2, 3 and following, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Yeah, but that's knowing him, not loving him. Wait, love is coming. And the one who says that I have come to know him doesn't keep his commandments as a liar and the truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. 1 John 2, 5. The love of God, our love for God, God's love for us is perfected in keeping, keeping the word of God. Jesus says a very similar thing, John 14, 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, this is the one who loves me. So loving Jesus and keeping Jesus' commandments are unbreakably tied together. Loving God, keeping his commandments are breakably tied together. And it's this, this, this commandment feeling, you see, that, that flushes out what love actually looks like in the Bible. It's not just, a, it's not just some sort of a warm feeling. This isn't a famous song, so I don't expect you to recognize this lyric, though some of you may, you know, if you were a big, uh, there's a Canadian singer, big, big splash in the United States, especially after 1972, had, usually his album still called Harvest is thought to be one of the greatest rock and roll albums of all time, a guy by the name of Neil Young, Neil Young. In 1971, Neil Young uh, wrote a song, Love in Mind. And in the refrain in the middle, he wrote this. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a premonition of what was going to be happening over the next 50 years in Western culture. And, and Neil Young caught it really nicely in a lyric. He wrote this. Man-made rules holding back my love. Can't hold it back no more. Churches long preach sex is wrong. Jesus, where is nature gone? And then three times in a row he asked the question, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? Church is long, preach sex is wrong. Well, they actually preach that it was defined into a covenant of marriage. Now, of course, Neil Young said, yeah, but that's just a man-made rule. But what if you started to ignore all the supposedly man-made rules? What would it be like then? What if you tried to live as if there's no laws at all, which is what he's sort, of, sort of advocating, right? Ah, man-made rules. You don't want to hold yourself back that way. Oh, complete disaster. Jesus, where is nature gone? I doubt if he saw it coming where we are now, right? What he meant is, well, you ought to be able to have sex with ever, whoever you want, whenever you want. But where, you know, that's he would not have guessed that there would be a fundamental denial of the distinction by 2021. I'm sure he's right online with it now. 
But he would have never guessed that that's how far from where is nature gone we might get. I don't think he would have guessed. All that to say, you see, to love God means fundamentally that you start, you live by the words of King Jesus. So the whole thing really holds together. So here you go. Jesus, the, the born, th those who are born from above, they were, Jesus is the Christ. He's Christ the King. He's Christ the King. And you know that you love people. That you're really loving people as you ought to love them when you love God. And therefore, love people within the framework of God's words. We don't kill them or steal from them or lie about them. You, you can find your sexuality within God's framework in marriage. You worship the living God. You do not use, take his name in vain. You, and, and just across the board, you have all of these. They define what love between us looks like. Well, we don't need that. All you have to do is just follow your feelings. Not true. You do that utter, complete disaster. So you have to decide. So which is it? Which is it for us? You know, John wrote this, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. Is that you? Or honestly, would you have to admit that this is you? By this we know that we are failing to love the children of God when we love the culture and observe its commandments, which most people do, which most people in the world do, and it's a disaster. So as Rodney Decker said, both in the Gospel of Mark and in our text, the big two questions are is, who is the Christ? Who do you think? Who's Jesus? Have you embraced him as Christ the King? And what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus? And what it looks like being shaped by his commandments through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you would enable us to find ourselves among those who know that Christ is the King, that Jesus is the Christ, and that we would be drawn to love those who have been begotten of God because we love you, the one who begets such people. And we would know that we love them precisely because we love you, honor you, and thereby submit our lives to your words and your ways in obedience. Lord, make us this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us, please?